Okay, why don't we go ahead and start it. So, welcome back everybody to uh, EE240. So, we're going to be grading the uh, midterms later tonight. So, we'll get those back to you guys on Thursday. So, I don't have any specific updates on that. Um, in terms of just logistics and things like that, homework number four is up. Um, it's a little bit sort of different in nature than kind of the previous ones. Um, it's a little bit more like a so-called miniature design project. So basically, I'm going to give you sort of an amplifier, some, or really sort of a set of specifications, and it's going to be your job to go and actually implement some amplifier that meets that set of specifications. So by the end of lecture, probably on Thursday, we'll actually walk through sort of a design procedure that might be representative of what you might want to use for the homework. Uh, but bottom line, you should definitely take a look at that fairly quickly because that'll be due basically right after the spring break. And you should actually have most of the material you need, certainly by the end of today, and if not, sort of everything by the end of Thursday, to actually go about doing that design. And since it is actually a design, it'll probably take some time for you to actually converge on, you know, how you actually bias things correctly and how you actually build the circuit and what the specs even are. So kind of bottom line, make sure you start on that well ahead of time. So last time we were kind of talking about settling, before maybe we dive back into that, I just wanted to see, is there any questions either on sort of class material so far or anything that was on the midterm or anything like that? You guys would all ace the midterm now. Okay, well, so we'll see if there's any kind of questions on that when we come back, uh, you know, on Thursday and you actually have the graded exams in front of you, maybe there'll be some questions uh, spurred by that. Uh, but unless there are any other questions, then let's go ahead and maybe dive back into the material. So last time we were really talking about basically settling from a time domain standpoint. And as we'd kind of motivated, that's usually of interest in a lot of the applications that we're talking about. Because oftentimes if we have something like, let's say, an oscilloscope or an ADC, we really care about just in the time domain, how close do we actually settle to the final value we really actually wanted to be at. So... We spent a little bit of time already talking about sort of how you can split those settling errors into two pieces. So one piece is the static errors that just have to do with the finite gain in either the OTA or the op amp you're using. And the other have to do with sort of the dynamic errors of just it takes you a certain amount of time to actually settle to that value. And since we're running these things at a certain speed, you, that time is obviously finite. Right? And so there's also going to be some error that's going to be incurred because of that. So I think where we basically ended up last time was talking first about the static settling error components. Um, and again, that's really just coming about because of the fact that we have essentially finite gain in this feedback loop here. Okay? So we had kind of just quickly walked through and said, well, okay, the gain we have in that feedback loop is really just F times the gain of the op amp, or the OTA again. And this is, of course, just the T0, meaning the DC open loop transfer uh, gain. And just as a reminder, you know, this F, that's just the feedback factor. And last time we talked about how basically when we include the input cap of the OTA, unfortunately that's going to reduce our feedback factor. Now, it's not going to change the closed loop gain because it doesn't really change the charge that's sampled on CS, but it is indeed going to change our feedback factor. So there's kind of a penalty for that, right? The penalty is the larger you make that CI, the smaller this feedback factor F, and therefore, really kind of, it's almost like we're attenuating the gain of that OTA. Right? So for a certain static settling error, you're going to need more gain in the OTA if you actually have a smaller feedback factor. Okay? Now, we're actually going to see in a second that the CI is also even going to amplify the noise of our amplifier. But on the other hand, you actually may even want actually somewhat of a large CI just because obviously the larger you can make that, the larger you can make the, basically, MOSFET that's sitting inside of that amplifier, and therefore, basically, the smaller the V star that you can use. Okay? So that's kind of the trade-off that we'd end up talking about last time. So all of that is actually fairly straightforward, but really sort of what's most interesting is to actually look at a specific example just to see sort of how some of the numbers turn out. So let's just say for this particular example, we want to build something that has a closed-loop gain of 4, obviously minus 4 to get the sign right. Let's just say that, you know, based on my noise or something, or my dynamic range, I figured out that I need a CS of 4 picofarads, a CF of, of course, 1 picofarad, because that's just set by the gain. And let me just take a guess that the input cap of my amplifier, you know, when I've sized it up and for this particular technology, happens to be 1 picofarad, okay? So 
By the way, just you know, if if you know, just to make sure you guys are paying attention, if I was if I really had the ideal sort of transistor, meaning I had no input capacitance at all, what would the feedback factor, ideally speaking, have been? What would that capital F be? And just as a reminder, you know, the topology we're thinking of is of course always the standard capacitive feedback. So CS, CF, that's the input, virtual ground, like this. Fourth, fourth. Ah, is it one fourth? For this particular topology? One fifth. One fifth, there we go, right? Because basically this guy is one fourth of CS. And so when you do the divider, it's actually one fifth, okay? So even if we had perfect transistors, you would add a, a feedback factor of one fifth, but now because we actually have some input cap from the device, it's going to turn out to be one sixth. Okay? Obviously, if I made the device larger, the feedback factor would be even smaller. Okay? So point there is again, kind of sucks because my feedback factor is actually even lower than that ideal thing, where that ideal thing is already slightly lower than the closed loop gain, just because of the configuration that we're using here. Okay? So now let's say that my error spec is less than 0.1%. Let's just see sort of what this implies about the kind of closed loop gain or actually the open loop gain we need from our OTA. Well, so if we want a 0.1% error, that basically means that T0, the sort of loop transfer gain, has to be greater than 1,000, right? Okay, that's maybe doesn't sound so bad. Maybe you can do that with like a CAS code, but then you have to keep in mind, well, oops, Actually, there's that f over there. So if I just push this back over, that means that because f is 1 sixth, I actually need an open loop gain of 6,000 for my OTA. Right? And by the way, remember that's over the output range. Okay, so pretty quickly you can see sort of if you want a pretty small settling error, you're going to need basically a pretty large gain out of your amplifier. Okay? This Kind of make sense to people? Or? Okay, so obviously the larger you make this closed loop gain, the larger the open loop gain of your amplifier is going to have to be. Because that's really the, mo the most direct thing that's going to be setting that F there. Oh, okay. So just one thing before we sort of move on. If you remember we had said that the total error that we're going to get from a settling standpoint is always going to be the combination of the dynamic error plus the static error, right? Okay, so now what we've seen is that if we want to get basically small static error, that essentially means that we need high open loop gain, right? Now, we're going to talk about the dynamic errors in one second, but as you can probably imagine, dynamic errors basically have to do with the gain bandwidth of the OTA, right? So now, here's an interesting question for you. You know, as a, as a sort of, let's say, the system guy or the person handing you the spec, I'm always going to tell you what this is. Because in general, I probably don't care all that much what's the dynamic portion versus what's the static portion. So for you as a designer, how do you think you'd want to trade between the two? Or I should say, which one do you think is cheaper to actually try and improve? In other words, if you had to choose between trying to improve the static error versus the dynamic error, which one do you think is sort of cheaper to go after? Static. Static, okay. I, I agree. Why? Um, static probably depends more on parasitic cap, whereas dynamic can depend more on bandwidth. And uh, okay, and well, you, so you're slightly more sophisticated. Let's even make life a little bit easier. Let's even pretend that I kind of had really high FT devices. So, you know, you mentioned parasitic cap. That's mostly having to do with this CI over here. So high FT would be small CGS. Small input right, cap. so small CGS, so small input cap. By the way, I mean, there's another way that you can solve static errors that doesn't involve changing capacitors, per se. Stages? <clears throat> two stages? Or? Okay, you could do two stages, but, you know, why is it you're saying you want to do two <coughs> stages? What's the sort of parameter you're trying to change here? DC gain? Yeah, you want to increase the DC gain, right? Now, why is it that we might claim that improving DC gain actually doesn't necessarily cost us all that much? And two stages, you know, you can actually make that argument, although that one's a little bit trickier. What else could you do to try and increase <coughs> DC gain that may not cost you that much? Cascode? Yeah, cascode, 
right? Or gain boosted cast code, or double gain boosted cast code, or longer channel device, and so on and so forth, right? So the real point there is that when you as a designer are choosing between those two, oftentimes you have a good motivation to just try and make the static error pretty small because that only costs you gain, right? That only forces you to lose large DC gain. But large DC gain, at least sort of from a fundamental, let's say, theoretical standpoint, doesn't necessarily have to cost you power, right? Because DC gain, that just has to do with how high of an output resistance can you get. Okay, now, obviously in practice, when you build that gain boosted cascode or you add that cascode in, you're adding some slight parasitics. So it's not that it's really truly free. But in principle, getting higher DC gain is usually cheaper than just making the darn amplifier faster, which is what the dynamic error really translates into. Right? Now, again, you shouldn't take this to sort of, let's say, infinity. Because at some point, once this static error is kind of small enough, it doesn't buy you all that much in terms of relaxing the dynamic specs, right? So let's just give some numbers here. So let's say that you know, your total settling error is supposed to be, I don't know, one microvolt. I'm just making it up, obviously. All right, so if you say it's one microvolt, and then you say, OK, fine, I'm going to make my static error one nanovolt. And so now, obviously, you have to make your, you know, the, the dynamic error you're going to allow is 999 nanovolts. So that's, let's say, dynamic, that's static. Right? At this point, probably ain't going to you know, buy you all that much to make the static error 0.5 nanovolts. Right? Because who cares? You're making no difference at all on the dynamic side. Right? An extra half a nanovolt, percentage-wise, doesn't let me relax the speed of the amplifier at all. Right? So in general, when you look at it, you're going to try and sort of push most of the burden onto the static side. But again, don't go sort of crazy with this. Because at some point, it does actually get sort of fairly painful to really build that high of a gain. And it really doesn't buy you all that much from the standpoint of the dynamic error. OK? Make sense to everybody? OK. So now that we sort of talked about the budgeting, let's actually go and take a look more carefully at the dynamic errors. Now, for dynamic errors or really dynamic settling, there's all kinds of stuff that's going to come into the picture here. So, First, of course, we have just finite gain bandwidth out of our OTA. We're actually going to have some feed forward zeros that you know, we've talked a little bit about that we'll talk more about in one second. We're going to have non-dominant poles inside of that OTA, perhaps because we did do some sort of gain boosting, or we had a folded cascode or something like that. We may even have some doublets inside of the OTA, again, if maybe we had done some gain boosting. And in fact, the OTA itself may not really be linear. In fact, certainly is not linear. So we may have some slewing effects. Okay? So, Obviously, I could try and do an analysis that includes each and every single one of these things all at the same time. Um, but I'm sure you'll agree with me if you try to do it, it's a little bit painful. Okay? So the general procedure we're going to take here is we're going to kind of look at each one of these things to the extent that we can one at a time, split all those different errors out, and then at the end, add them all together. Okay? So it's obviously somewhat approximate. But we'll see, actually, most of the stuff we're going to deal with, there's a pretty simple way to kind of work it out so that you really can deal with it in that way. Okay? So that's kind of the general strategy. So let's just start out with kind of the simplest thing first. So first, let's just take our sort of OTA here and take a look at just assuming that the OTA itself was perfect. Let's just look at sort of what the dynamics for that system would look like. Okay? So first, let's ignore, you know, this is kind of the final transfer function we're going to end up with. But Ignore the zero up here for one second. We'll see how we can get to that fairly shortly. Okay? So first, let's just see if we can kind of figure out just what should the pole of this thing be? What should, what should the dominant closed loop pole be coming from? So in general, what should something like that be coming from? And by the way, I should draw this symbol more correctly. This is really meant to be an OTA. Okay? So it's just the GM stage right there. So if I just have a GM stage like that in feedback, what should the sort of closed loop gain bandwidth or closed loop, uh, actually, we can even do it any which way you want. So what, what should like the closed loop pole be set by? The effective capacitance over GM. Yeah, so it's basically the effective capacitance divided by the effective GM, right? 
that's of course the time constant. The, the inverse of that is the pole, right? Okay, so let's start with the effective GM. So what is the effective GM from the standpoint of settling or setting the bandwidth of this circuit here? FGM. There we go, right? It's 1 over FGM, right? Or rather, I should say, the effective GM is just FGM, right? Because if I dumped a little piece of current out in that output right there, if I had had unity gain feedback, it would have just been a 1 over GM resistor. But since I have this essentially voltage divider, then I only get F of the voltage back on the gate. And so the amount of GM you get is just F times GM, right? Okay, so indeed, that's the effective GM you get. And the CL effective here, I'm not going to actually walk through it. It's fairly straightforward. It's just CL plus the series combination of CF with CS plus CI. Okay, so turns out, you know, you can do this algebra very quickly by yourself in your head or, or just, you know, work it out afterwards. Turns out that whole capacitance over there just is CL plus 1 minus F times CF. Okay? But... This whole expression over here, that's just really CL plus that series combination of these caps. Okay? So nothing magic happening there. So it makes sense? That's where our sort of closed loop pole is going to be. Okay, so now the only thing that's sort of left in figuring out what the dynamics of this thing will be, and again, this is kind of the simplified case where we're just looking at a single pole now. The only additional kind of quote unquote trick we have here. So if we look carefully at this configuration, if as an example I put in a step right there on the input, well remember initially, you know, amplifier can't really do anything because capacitors don't like to change their voltage instantaneously, right? They're kind of like short circuits at very high frequency. Okay, so if I put a step like that, before the amplifier can actually do anything, what's going to happen at the output? What are we going to see? Yeah, we're also going to see a step. In which direction is that step going to be? Yeah, so in this particular case, we're going to see a step up, right? Because basically, the step from the input is just literally going to feed through those caps to the output, right? Now, it's not going to be exactly the same height, right? It's going to be attenuated by some capacitive divider there. But indeed, it's going to step up to the output. Now. Uh, one thing that's a little bit interesting, and you know, we'll go through in a little bit more detail. So I get initially this glitch up like this. But by the way, eventually, what's the sign of the output going to be for this particular configuration here? If I had a step up at the input. Inverting. Yeah, it's inverting, right? So in fact, the waveform you're going to see is something like that. Okay? Now, any time you have something like this where basically the output immediately jumps when the input jumps, you must have a zero. Okay, so in this particular case, you know, this is often called sort of the feed forward zero. We're going to see, or yeah, I can actually even see from the transfer function already, this turns out to be a right half plane zero. And it's a right half plane zero simply because the sign of the output basically flips from the initial step to the final value. Right? In other words, the sort of the sign of the gain for this feed forward path is the opposite of the gain through the amplifier itself. Okay? So now just to actually sort of figure out how I got to this particular thing, you've probably seen that many times before in let's say 140 or something like that. But just as a reminder and kind of a quick way of doing these things, you can of course do the sort of brute force approach of just write down a bunch of nodal equations and solve it, but it turns out there's kind of a nice trick we can play to solve these types of things very quickly without actually doing a lot of that. And so the key thing to remember that is that at the frequency of the zero, and by the way, this is not the sort of physical frequency, this is like the imaginary frequency you put in to actually get the zero. But basically, when that frequency is at the zero frequency, then we know that by definition, V out should be zero, right? Just that's the definition of a zero, okay? So it turns out we can actually use that to very quickly figure out what should that frequency really be. And to see that, let's just do sort of a very simple model here. 
So I have my input voltage. I have some, basically, my coupling capacitor there, right? Which, by the way, just for, you know, for this example, I'm looking at something that looks like this. Okay, so I just basically have you know, my transistor with the CF across it like this. Okay, so I've got my CF, I've got some input voltage, and then of course I've got a GM times VI, right? Okay, well, so now, again, at that zero frequency, by the way, there could be all kinds of other stuff hanging out over here, you know, whatever I want to be putting there. But essentially, at that frequency, we know that since V out is equal to zero, basically, whatever the current that's flowing through that cap has to be exactly the same as the current flowing through that GM, right? And in fact, because the output is zero, we can very quickly calculate what the current through that cap actually is. So let's call that ICF. So what is that current if the output voltage is really zero? What do you guys think? Now we're back in like E40 land. So what is that current? In the S domain, by the way. SCF VI. There we go. It's just SCF times VI, right? Because the voltage across the cap, since the output is zero, the voltage across the cap is just VI. Okay, so of course, that's going to be have to equal to GM times VI. Okay? Well, nicely enough, we have VI on both sides of the equation, and VI is, of course, the same. And what we're interested in is solving for the frequency of the zero, which, of course, tells us that the zero is at GM over CF. Okay? And indeed, that's exactly what we've said over here. Now, notice I did not get the sign incorrect here. It really is positive zero on the right half plane, zero. Okay? And again, that just has to do with the fact that that path there has the inverse sign from the closed loop transfer function. Okay, so we know what this transfer function looks like. Now, just like you know, I sort of did to you in your homeworks at some point, I can take that transfer function and try and figure out, okay, well, what's going to be the time domain response to that step? So obviously there's the brute force way of doing this, which is just to say, okay, I take that transfer function that looks something like this. So I've just now rewritten it as being a zero and a pole. I multiply it, of course, by some step, which is V step over S. And now, you know, if I was, I don't know if mean, but now you could basically just sort of do inverse Laplace transforms or something like that, which I'm sure you guys all love doing, and get an actual time domain response. Well, turns out, particularly for something that looks like this, there's a much, much easier way of doing things, okay? And actually, sort of, I touched upon this in the homeworks. So I tried to get you to kind of think about how you might do something like this. So for something that really looks like this, 90x% of the time, the easier way to really deal with it is just to think about the following two things. So one is, what will initially happen right after the step comes in? And the next is, what will eventually happen at the very end of time? Because I claim if you know those two points, then actually writing out what the overall time domain response is is quite easy, okay? So let's just see sort of how we would do that. So first of all, what would be the initial value of the output? Anybody know? By the way, anybody heard of the initial value theorem? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So you guys at the very least should know how to do it, but if not, you know, even, even just intuitively you should be able to figure it out. <coughs> minus Z? Uh, almost. No, th there is a minus Z in there, but not quite. Between C? Okay, there's certainly a C, right? That's just a scale factor, so that, that, that ain't going away. I definitely believe that. Oh, minus C over Z, uh, PZ? There we go. So it's minus C times P over Z. Okay, because basically the way you find this is always the limit as s goes to infinity of s times whatever function it is that you're interested in. Okay, 
So basically, you know, if you had a step at the input, then of course, when I multiply that by s, these two things cancel. s going to infinity means I just ignore that, those two things, and indeed you get minus c times p over z. Okay? And again, by the way, often if you have a real circuit, it's easy to just look at the circuit and figure out what the actual response ends up being. Okay? So that's my initial value. Let's see what my final value is going to be. And this one obviously should be much easier. Minus C, yes, right? Because, of course, just by kind of definition, right? And by the way, just in case you've forgotten, again, that's how you find the final value. Okay, you know, more formally, if you're not entirely sure, that's how you do it. Here, it's kind of obvious, right? Okay, so now all we have to do is kind of remember a couple of, let's say, interesting or useful properties of linear systems. So... If this is my initial value, in general, if I told you I had a single pole system that had some initial value in it, and I asked you how does that evolve over time, what would be the answer? How would, it, how would the system respond to that initial value? Exponential decay. Yeah, it's just an exponential <laughs> decay, right? So right off the bat, I can basically say that v out as a function of time should just be equal to that initial value times in an exponential decay. Now, by the way, what is the sort of time constant associated with that exponential decay? The pole. Yeah, it's just the pole, right? It's always the pole, no matter what. So in fact, it would just be, and I'll be more clear since I didn't give a sign. Oh, no, actually, I did. So it's just that, right? OK. So that's the response of the system to the initial value. Now. How is it going to get to that final value? What sort of type of function is that going to look like? 1 minus exponential. Yeah, it's just 1 minus exponential, right? So now I can say that this is the initial part. Then for the final part, I just do, oops, not t over p, uh, t, yes, t p, sorry. And this is, of course, also e to the minus t p, right? So that's my final piece, right? OK, well, now actually, this is really easy to just rewrite into a slightly simpler form. So now all I do is I say I'm just going to rearrange the exponential terms. So now this is going to be minus c times 1 minus 1 minus p over z times e to the minus tp. OK? And this is indeed the final form that we're actually going to be interested in. OK, but I claim this is kind of a lot easier than doing inverse Laplace and things like that. Because I just find the initial thing, find the final thing, combine them together. Okay? And so, by the way, you know, if you're writing frantically, don't worry. The equation's right here on the next slide. Okay? And so this is indeed, you know, this one, you, I could argue, I guess, I, I got to this by doing the inverse Laplace transform, but basically tells us exactly what we had just gone through. Okay? So this is actually kind of a little bit interesting. You should keep this in mind, because we're going to see this in one more second. Notice that what the zero is really kind of doing to us is it's sort of like changing the magnitude of the exponential settling piece of things, right? And so by the way, notice here that since p and z had inverse signs, this whole quantity here is going to be greater than 1, okay? Because as an example, p was negative and z was positive. So this whole quantity here is greater than 1. So what this is going to do to us is the, really the effect of that zero is going to be to sort of increase the amount of swing we have to do off of that exponential settling piece. Okay? On the other hand, and again, we'll see this a little bit later, if this whole quantity here was actually positive, meaning p and z had the same sign, which of course, if you had a stable thing, they had better both be negative, right? This whole thing is actually going to reduce the amount of swing we have to do. So again, as we'll see in one second, actually that's going to translate into something that will settle faster than it otherwise would have. Okay? So now that we've got sort of you know, that time domain response, let's see what that translates into from the standpoint of our sort of amplifier design. And so just to start out with, let's assume that I have something like a really large load capacitance, or maybe I just have a really big transistor, so that essentially my feedback factor, or really my feed forward, is pretty small. Okay? In other words, this p over z is something much, much less than 1. 
So if I do that, then really I just have something that looks like this. All right, so just have kind of your standard exponential settling behavior. Okay? Well, so it turns out the easiest way to really sort of think about this is not actually to sort of look really at this equation per se, but rather to ask yourself, okay, if I want to get a certain relative error, and let's call that error epsilon, okay? By the way, that epsilon would be something like, let's say, 1%, 0.1%, 0.2%, whatever, okay? So it turns out the easiest way to really look at this is to say, if I want to get that certain relative error epsilon, basically how long do I have to wait to actually make sure that this exponential settles to within that epsilon, okay? So all the sort of math over here is doing is exactly asking that question, saying, okay, this epsilon is the difference between the final value you really wanted and what you get after a certain amount of settling time. Okay, and clearly that's just basically e to the minus t over tau, okay, where that t is, of course, the settling time. So now if you just sort of back that out a little bit, that just says that the relative, the amount of time you have to spend to settle that thing is always going to be related to the natural log of that epsilon, right? And of course, it's really basically set by how many tau you use. In other words, if I want to get, let's say, you know, an E reduction, you know, an, uh, sorry, if I want to get something that where the epsilon is equal to 1 over E, then I basically have to wait for 1 tau, right? So the easiest thing really to just kind of remember in this context is that if I have this exponential settling like this, it's going to take you 2.3 tau per decade of settling, okay? So what I mean by that is let's say you have an amplifier with, and actually let's go through this example, with let's say I want 1% settling, and it has let's say a 4.6 nanosecond clock cycle to do that settling in, then I know my tau had better be 1 nanosecond. Because this 1%, that's two decades of settling, okay? Of course, you can sort of flip this around the other way. You can say, well, okay, all right, let's say that I wanted, I don't know, 0.1% settling, and my tau is, I don't know, two nanoseconds, right? Then very quickly, I can figure out sort of like what's the maximum speed you can actually operate at. Because if I want 0.1% settling, that's now three decades. So what's my maximum speed if I want to actually hit that spec with tau of 2 nanoseconds and 0.1% settling error? What's the fastest I can go? Point 0.1%? Yeah, so I want point 0.1% now. So how many tau do I need? 6.9? Yeah, so I need 6.9 tau. And so, of course, if tau is 2 nanoseconds, then I need something almost like 14 nanoseconds, right? I guess technically 13.8 to be precise, right? So, again, this is actually a very useful thing to kind of remember because if you remember 2.3 tau per decade, you can go any which way you want with that calculation, okay? And actually, as we'll see, if not today, then next lecture, this is really pretty useful to, to know because a lot of the time, the effective load capacitance we have to use is going to be set by noise. So if you know the effective load capacitance and you know how fast you want to run, once you know this settling constraint, you can use that to determine how much GM your amplifier actually needs, which of course also determines the amount of power your amplifier is going to be burning, right? So again, if you remember nothing else, just remember 2.3 tau per decade. That one's you know, pretty much fundamental. It pops up all over the place. Okay? So now, this, is what the, this was the case where we basically said we could ignore that feed forward zero. So now if we want to add that thing back in, because of course, in general, that may not necessarily be negligible, turns out the way we can handle that is actually pretty easy. Because all that's going to happen is the following. So if you remember we said that we had already mentioned before this 1 minus p over z. All that was really doing was increasing the swing we needed to do. Right? So if I didn't have that feed forward 0, my settling would look something like this. 
But because I have that zero, now it's going to look something like, let's say that, right? So really all that's going to do to us is now, if before this was the swing I needed to do in order to settle to a certain spot, now because of that feed forward, there's like this extra 1 minus p over z times v swing that you have to do in t to settle to the right spot, okay? Well, good news is once I know that, it's actually really easy to figure out what the impact will be on my overall settling time. Because if you, you know, just kind of walk back and figure out what is actually this 1 minus p over z, turns out that p over z is just this. It's fcf over cl effective. Okay, and again, if you don't believe me, just you know, take a look at that transfer function. You'll see immediately that that's what it is. Okay? So effectively now, we still are going to have this exponential settling. It's just that rather than our error being the true error relative to the swing, basically because we had to do this extra swing over here, we're effectively also multiplying our error by that extra distance. Okay? So that's where this sort of term on the bottom right here comes up from. So again, just to kind of give some simple examples here, because it's usually the most useful to just look at the examples. So let's say I wanted a closed loop gain of a quarter. By the way, this is kind of a silly example somewhat, just to exacerbate the problem, because you know, gain of a quarter, I'm not exactly sure why you'd want, but it doesn't matter. So let's say it's a gain of a quarter, CF of one picofarad, CS of 250 femtofarads. Again, let me just assume that CI is going to be 250 femto. And let's pretend I have a CL of 1 picofarad, OK? So if you run the numbers for all of this stuff, it tells you you have a feedback factor of 0.67, an effective load cap of 1.33 puff, OK? So the interesting thing here is to sort of compare, by the way, again, in this particular example, I made the closed loop gain small and sort of set things up this way, because I really wanted to have a large CF in order to have a large feed forward. Right, because obviously if we go back and just take a look at the amplifier over here, the bigger we make CF, the more feed forward you're going to get. Right, because kind of the closer you're coupling those two nodes to each other. Right? Okay, so even in this kind of somewhat silly example, if I didn't have that feed forward at all, my settling time would have been 6.9 tau to get to 0.1% settling. Okay? But now, even if I include this relatively large feed forward, now all that's going to happen is, rather than having 6.9 tau, I'm actually going to get 7.3 tau that I need in terms of settling. Okay. So that's kind of good news, because it says that even when I really tried to exacerbate the problem, in the worst case, I kind of needed just you know, another like half tau or so of settling. If I were already needed about 7, OK, you know, it's a 10% penalty, but it's not all that big of a deal, right? And really, the kind of the magic that's happening there is that because it's exponential settling, every extra tau that you wait basically buys you another factor of 2.5 or whatever it is, approximately, right? So in other words, unless the speed forward is really like multiplying the swing by some ridiculously large number, it's not going to have a huge impact on the amount of settling you have to do. Now, of course, if you're actually building the thing, you should really take that into account because you want to make sure you actually hit the specs you were given. But the good news is this isn't like a horrible penalty to pay. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? Yeah. Sorry, say that again? What's the sign of P and Z? So P and Z here are literally defined this way. So basically, because that 0 is in the right half plane, this z would be negative. Okay, So it actually doesn't really matter too much, because it's really the sign of p over z that matters in terms of setting the swing. But you should just keep in mind, this whole quantity here is greater than 1 for our particular amplifier. Okay, In general, it may not be, but for our particular amplifier, it is. Any other questions on this? Or? OK, so we've beaten the sort of single pole case to death. So now, of course, we're going to make things a little bit more interesting and add in the non-dominant pole. Okay? 
Now, unfortunately, the trick with non-dominant poles is that, you remember I said initially I wanted to sort of decouple everything and look at one piece at a time and add the errors together? Well, unfortunately, in order to have a non-dominant pole, I needed a, non -do a, po a dominant pole in the first place. So slightly more difficult to actually decouple those two things away from each other. So to actually sort of get an understanding of what the impact of that's going to be, I'm going to sort of come up with a fairly simple model. So I'm just going to pretend as an example that my GM, rather than it just being sort of a single transistor or something with no dynamics in it, I'm going to model that GM as having an additional non-dominant pole in it. Okay? As an example, that might come from, if I build this out of a CAS code, that non-dominant pole might be the sort of pole at that CAS code node. Okay? So just to sort of clarify things and make things a little bit easier to understand, I'm just going to define that non-dominant pole, this P2, as being at some k times omega u. This omega u here is just the unity gain frequency of the closed loop transfer function. Okay? So in other words, I just want to basically set this non-dominant pole to be at some factor relative to kind of the crossover of my loop. Okay? So now here's kind of the interesting question. In general, poles kind of slow you down, right? They're kind of filtering the high frequency stuff out. So in general, if you had to pick, where do you think you would want to set this non-dominant pole to be? You know, you're, you're God, or you, just, you get to choose you know, great devices. Where do you want to put the, that non-dominant pole at? Where's the best place for you to put it? OK, good. That's the, the default answer everybody gives. You know, it's a pole. It kind of sucks. Why don't I just put it at infinity? Well, turns out. If you actually want to make things settle as fast as you possibly can, that may not necessarily be the right answer. Okay? Very strange, very sort of weird, but let's see how that works. So, ah, okay, well, we're going to see actually what it really needs to be in one second. So, you, you know, Dan was saying it has to be critically damped. Turns out, slightly more complicated than that, but you're actually going in the right direction. Okay? So, let's see what really happens here. So, first, this blue line, that's just the time domain response of a single pole system. Okay. So obviously, as I change this k, if I make that k really, really big, as an example, 100, meaning the non-dominant pole is way the heck at much, much higher frequencies, then obviously the time domain response basically looks exactly the same as the single pole. Okay. So for both of those, this is just the you know basically simple exponential settling we had talked about before. Well, OK, so now let's say that I was really aggressive, and I made the non-dominant pole sit right on top of the transfer, the loop, the crossover. Okay, So that's, as an example, this k equals 1 here. Well, that one's also kind of bad, but maybe not for the reason we initially thought. right? Because that one sort of looks bad because it's kind of initially slow, but then it actually picks up some momentum. right? And in fact, once I get beyond this time point right there, in fact, it's actually getting closer to the final value earlier than my single pole thing was. The only problem is it's going to overshoot and then ring around for a while, right? So that's bad because if you sort of think about the settling error, what you really want to make sure is that if I have a certain error spec, so that's, let's say, plus minus epsilon around the final value. What you really care about from the standpoint of settling is, when does your amplifier basically get inside of that error band and stay there forever? right? So if I have this, this under-damped case, or this maybe perhaps even critically damped case, then basically, unfortunately, I'm going to overshoot. right? And if I overshoot too far, it's going to take me some time to actually get back into my nice error band here. right? So what this kind of tells you is that actually what you should really be doing is choosing that non-dominant pole just in the right spot so that actually that momentum that was being picked up does actually push you faster and closer to the right answer but doesn't push you so far over that actually you come out of that error band, right? 
And again, the intuition here is that when you have sort of that non-dominant pole, it's kind of like another, let's say, integration in the loop. Right? It's something else that's saying, okay, oh, I didn't quite make it to where I am. I didn't quite make it to where I am. I should start speeding up. Right? So it's sort of like giving you some extra push or extra momentum. Right? And so even though initially you go slower, if you build up enough momentum, you actually get pushed closer to the right answer faster. The only trick is if you have too much momentum, you go too far, right? And then you have to come back, OK? So in this particular example, it looks like actually setting that k equals to 3, which is the red curve right here, has a little bit of overshoot, but actually gets to within that error band and stays there faster than the single pole system does, OK? So just to make that sort of really clear, what I've drawn here is just essentially the relative error as a function of time for these three different cases here, right? So again, for the single pole, the relative error is just going to be this exponential settling. For this k equals 1, as you sort of overshoot, here I'm just drawing the magnitude. So every time you overshoot, that's where you get these sort of bumps like this, right? Whereas for this k equals 3 case, Again, I'm still going to have a little bit of overshoot, but you can see it's sort of controlled in its magnitude, right? So the way you really figure out what's the best thing for you to do is you basically just draw a horizontal line. You say, okay, if I want my you know, settling accuracy to be to that point there, which let's say is, I don't know, 0.1% or something like that, you just draw that line, and if you have a bunch of families of these different k's, you'd pick which k actually lands you at that vertical, that horizontal line, and stays below it earliest, right? So in fact, if you sort of do that experiment, so here what I'm actually showing is just what is the time at which you hit that horizontal line and stay below it as a function of that k. And by the way, this thing looks really funny and has all these jagged lines in it exactly because if I start going in this direction, I get these bumps, right? And so I sort of get these things where I thought I would be done right here, but actually because of the next bump, I need to jump over one, right? So that's kind of why you get this funny looking shape here. But basically what you can see is that the optimum in terms of the settling is that right around this sort of, it's about a K of 3.3, okay? Which turns out I believe to be about 70-ish degrees of phase margin, OK? So definitely not at like 45 degrees or something like that, because that's, you know, that's over in this region over here. And in fact, if you really do this right, you know, even though, again, it's, you'd think that pole, second poles are bad for you, well, it turns out you can actually be 30% faster than the completely overdamped system just by choosing that k at the right spot. Okay, by the way, this, you know, this line over here, that just converges to this dotted line. That's the single pole settling. Which, again, you know, in case you've forgotten, that's just 6.9 tau, because right? this is for 0.1% settling error. Okay? So there's kind of two key things here. So one is actually using that non-dominant pole may really be to your advantage. You might actually be able to build the amplifier faster than you would have if you didn't use it. But the other thing that's kind of important here, and which is, again, sort of should match with your intuition, is even though you can kind of play that game, you still don't want anything that's going to be too underdamped. Right? So if you make the thing too underdamped, then now you're definitely going to be ringing around, and you're not going to settle quickly. Right? That's kind of what these big jumps and everything here are showing you. So bottom line, for something like you know, a relative settling of 0.1%, K of 3 or 3.3 is about right, but definitely don't go below a K of about 2, OK? So now there's just one other sort of interesting thing for us to keep in mind here. So can I just always say that the optimum K is 3.3, no matter what? Or do you actually need sort of one more piece of information to really know what the best non-dominant pole location is? Is it always going to be exactly 3.3? or? Is there one other sort of thing that comes into the picture here? Static error. Uh, okay. Well, it's not exactly the static error, but you know, you're you're kind of touching on the right thing. 
In other words, what's the sort of what's the parameter here that I could change that would actually change what this number should be? Epsilon. Yeah, epsilon, right? Because if we go back and look at this plot here, if I told you, for example, that I don't know, I had a really silly amplifier, or I just wanted an epsilon of 0 0.2, well, clearly, for that particular case, the green curve is better than the red curve, right? Now. Obviously, 0 0.2 is, a, again, a very silly value. But this tells you that the optimum non-dominant pole for you to choose is really dependent upon what's the settling error you're interested in. Okay. So to actually really quantify that, that's kind of this plot that I've shown you here. Um, actually, getting this plot is a little bit involved because you have to do all these different settling responses and sweep it across you know, epsilon. You know, trust me, you can go back and reproduce this. You'll get the same answer. But what's kind of interesting here is that the way this is behaving really sort of should intuitively make some sense to you. Okay? So what's happening here is that as you move in this direction, that's basically saying you want something more accurate. You can only tolerate a smaller residual error. Okay? So now you guys tell me, why does it make perfect sense that as you want something to be more and more accurate, the optimal K you want to use actually goes up? Why does that make sense? Any ringing, any overshoot will kill you. Yeah, exactly. Right. So if I want something really, really accurate, then if I have even just a small little overshoot there, if that overshoot is bigger than my error spec, I'm going to have to wait for the thing to settle back out. Right. So that's exactly why that's happening. So as you go in that direction, basically you're trying to get a little bit less overshoot. Okay. Now you can see the variation isn't like huge. Right, so from about 0.1% where we said it was 3.3, all the way down to like 10 to the minus 5, it's only going up to like 3.7. But that's exactly intuitively why it's actually a function of the epsilon you want. Okay. And again, you kind of get these funny conditions where, as you you know, if you were to really make some horrible settling errors, you might actually get very different answers down at these much lower k's. But for kind of almost anything that you're really interested in. You can see this plot always tells you that you still want to avoid a k of less than about 2. Or again, that k is just related to where is the non-dominant pole relative to the loop crossover. Okay. So again, good news is if I give you some settling spec and I tell you, you know, I want you to build the fastest amplifier you possibly can, you can go and grab this plot. You don't have to reproduce it. And you can actually use that to try and intentionally place your non-dominant pole to get the fastest response you possibly can. Okay. Does this make sense to everybody? OK. Oops. So we've covered our sort of feed forward 0. We've covered the dominant pole. We've now even covered the non-dominant pole. Now to everybody's, well, it's not our last topic, but it's usually one of everybody's favorites that we spent a lot of time on previously as well. And that's these pole 0 doublets. Okay. So again, these are basically the doublets that, as an example, may show up if you have something like a gain boosting loop inside of your amplifier, or if you have some other nested feedback loop type of structure. Okay? So in order to handle the doublets here, basically, again, I'm going to sort of use a slightly simplified model. So I'm going to say that, let's say that inside of my GM stage, rather than it being just a pure GM, it's going to have some zero and some pole inside of it. Okay? Now, if we're talking about doublets, that kind of usually means that that pole and that zero should be close to each other. Okay. So in order to model that, I'm just going to sort of do a simple redefinition here. So what I'm going to say is that let's assume that the zero is at the same, basically the same spot as the pole, but just shifted by this alpha factor, where that alpha factor is related to one plus epsilon. Okay. Now, you know, I guess I shouldn't have overloaded the symbol like this. This epsilon just means something small. Okay? It's kind of uh, telling you, roughly speaking, how close is the zero to the pole. Okay? Now, the other thing I want to do here is just define that pole, which again is inside of the GM stage itself. I want to define it as some beta times omega 3 dB, where this 3 dB is just the 3 dB bandwidth of the open loop transfer function, okay? or the open loop loop transfer, I should say. Okay. 
Because we're going to see in one second that depending upon both where that non-dominant pole or where that pole zero doublet pole is and how close the zero is to it, that's going to sort of change the overall impact of this on our settling error. Okay? Does this kind of make sense to everybody here? Okay. So if I take this as my model for the amplifier, and then I plug that into my sort of closed loop gain expression, which again just looks something like this, then you can actually pretty quickly figure out that you should see something that looks like this. Okay, so I'm still going to have the sort of old 3 dB bandwidth that I used to, but now I'm going to have this pole zero doublet on top of it. And so what I wrote here isn't exactly correct, but roughly speaking, or actually ex this is precise, whatever the zero was in that GM will also still be the zero in this over overall closed loop transfer function. The pole will move slightly, okay? So the pole you end up from that doublet won't exactly be at this omega p, and that's kind of why I've noted as being this omega p p, but it'll be sort of somewhere close to that, okay? So roughly speaking, that pole is going to be at still that omega p, okay? Now again, I'm just going through kind of this whole model here, just so that we're going to have a somewhat simplified way to understand what are the errors that are going to be caused by this pole zero doublet, okay? And really to actually motivate why we had said before that that pole zero doublet, kind of where we end up wanting to put it relative to our overall settling response, okay? So if I do that, then again, much like you had the fun of doing on the homework, you can basically go and sort of do an inverse Laplace transform and figure out what's the time domain response for this overall system. And as you might expect, because you have two poles, the overall response basically has two exponential settling pieces in it, right? Where the time constants for each of those exponentials is just set by the two individual poles that we have. Okay? So now, why did I sort of go through all that trouble of you know, defining these betas and epsilons and etc.? Well, it turns out if I write things out in this way, I can actually come up with a fairly simple approximation for what piece of the response is going to be set by really the part that we cared about, meaning the actual amplifier and its 3 dB bandwidth, versus what piece of the response is coming about because of that pole that's inside of the doublet. Okay. So again, just to remind you guys, beta is equal to, uh, just to be clear, Beta is equal to omega p over omega 3 dB, okay? And epsilon was equal to, or I should really say that omega z is just equal to omega p over 1 plus epsilon, okay? In other words, if epsilon is 0, the pole and the 0 are right on top of each other, okay? So if you use those two things, and what you can actually do is come up with very quickly what is the amount of the response or the multiplier in front of the response that's set by the amplifier itself versus how much is coming from that pole zero doublet, okay? So let's just sort of take these things to the limits first. So let's say that epsilon is actually zero. In other words, the pole and the zero are right on top of each other. What kind of transfer function do we have? Yeah, it's a single pole transfer function, right? So if I have a single pole transfer function, it makes perfect sense that this thing over here is just zero, right? Because there's no other pole for me to settle with. Okay, well, so now actually what's sort of interesting to see is what happens if I don't exactly have a single pole. But actually I make this epsilon like, I don't know, 0.1% or something like that. Well, what's going to happen is that this first piece right there, roughly speaking, it's just going to be sort of 1 minus that. So it's kind of almost everything is settling to that, but to within some small error, right? Now, what we can do is actually figure out how big that error actually ends up being. Well, so first of all, clearly, it's proportional to the error between the pole and the zero, right? So the closer those two things are to each other, the smaller the impact of this thing is going to be. Not only that, you can actually see that it depends somewhat on 
where, how far away is that pole from your actual dominant pole that you care about, right? Because you can see as an example, or maybe I'll just ask you guys, if I make that beta really, really big, what happens to the amount of settling I get from that non-dominant doublet piece? Small. Yeah, it's small, right? The bigger you make that beta, in other words, the farther away you push that doublet, the less impact this thing is going to have, okay? So, keep these things in mind just because it's kind of a useful way to approximate what's going to be happening. This is just sort of showing you an example of what really, you know, sort of just some time domain plots. But these really kind of just say what we would expect them to, right? So essentially what they basically say is, and by the way, I've chosen some relatively bad examples here. So if I had the ideal single pole, this is how I would settle. And if I have the doublet, where in this case I actually put the doublet pretty far away, and I actually put that pole from the doublet inside of my bandwidth, what you can see is that I fairly quickly settle to basically some initial value. And then I have this long, slow piece, which is again coming from that doublet, which is trying to take me up the rest of the way. Okay? So how are we really going to sort of deal with this? Turns out it's kind of straightforward, right? So in the first and hopefully the ideal case, which is really what you should be targeting, if you make sure that that doublet is outside of your bandwidth, in other words, that beta is greater than or equal to 1, then basically that thing is going to settle faster than your dominant pole is. And if it settles faster than your dominant pole, basically it's not really going to have a big impact on you, right? So in essence, you basically don't have to worry about it there. So that's good. So of course, the only other case is, what if it's not actually faster? What if it's actually sitting inside of your bandwidth? Well, now life is a little bit more interesting, right? So that's where you're going to have things that look like this. So in general, I'd claim that you probably don't want to do this, but you know, if you're really clever or maybe you know, you're really pushing the limits, sometimes you can actually get away with this. So now, you guys tell me, when is it that you might claim that you could kind of get away with this? What is the, what is, what's sort of the considerations that are going to come into play to tell you whether it's actually OK for you to have this doublet like this that's sitting inside of your bandwidth? How would you decide that? the knob that's being turned. Relative settling error? Yeah, exactly. Right? So basically, if I had said that, look, my settling spec is only to within 10%, right? Then essentially, if whatever junk I'm getting from the pole zero doublet is smaller than that 10%, who cares, right? Because it's not actually changing when I hit the thing that I care about, right? Now, the quote unquote bad news about that is, as you can kind of see from this, if your settling spec was, let's say, something like 0.1%, roughly speaking, that tells you that you have to make sure that that pole and that zero are basically within 0.1% of each other, right? In other words, the sort of difference between them has to be less than 0.1%. Because if it's not, then as you can see from this B term here, the relative error you get is actually going to be larger than what your spec is. Okay? So that's why actually in general, in fact, for most things that you're going to do, you're probably going to want to avoid doing this. Because unless you can really somehow guarantee that that pull and that zero are going to land within that settling accuracy of each other. Or by the way, unfortunately, you know, when you have those doublets, it's usually set by some GM versus some capacitance, and you may not be able to control those two things relative to each other, right? Or you may not even be, it may even be like an RO or something like that. In general, you probably can't guarantee that that's going to be close enough to hit your settling spec. So most of the time, you're really just going to say, OK, if I really wanted to settle within that accuracy, Let's just make sure that any pole zero doublets I have are outside of the bandwidth of my amplifier. Because if I do that, then I basically don't have to worry about them. Right? Yeah. Ah. 
Uh, I'd, basically, if beta is equal to 1 there, this is really an approximation. So it's not exactly correct, you know, because this is obviously saying that this thing goes off to infinity. Beta is not intended to be 1 here. Uh, the approximation doesn't quite work there. Uh, you might actually have something that's slightly unstable if you did that. So that's kind of why things are breaking down a little bit. So you shouldn't take this as being set in stone. It's really, you know, it's an approximation. You can actually work out a slightly more detailed expression if you really want to. Like greater than 1.5? Yeah, uh, something like that. Approximately, yes. But really, it just comes down to don't do it. You know, just <laughs> make sure it's at least like 2, 3, something like that, far enough away that it's not going to cause you any problems. Uh, by the way, if you really want to, you can actually figure out the more precise expressions based on the homework. You know, the solutions from the homework that had that, a pole, you know, two poles and a zero. You can actually work out all of the stuff that we did here by using that. And you can get even more sort of accurate expressions. It's just they don't quite as nicely show you this epsilon behavior here. So that's why I kind of used it in this particular form. But, you know, bottom line, if you have a pole zero doublet, unless you're, you know, you really, really know what you're doing, get it outside of your bandwidth. Any other questions on this, sir? Okay. So, just one sort of quick note on doublets, just because it's a little bit interesting and kind of fun. So, most of the time I've been sort of complaining about these things. And I've been telling you, you know, just be careful, get it outside your bandwidth, you know, you don't want to deal with it. But actually, sometimes you can really make use of these things. Okay, you can actually even do better than you otherwise could have by utilizing full zero doublets. So, the kind of classic example to see that is to actually think about an oscilloscope. Okay, so how many of you guys have used one of these real-time scopes that had, and they claim they have an Rn of one, oops, one mega ohm? Any of you guys ever seen that on the scope? Okay. So now this should, you know, if you kind of think about this a little bit, let's say you have a scope with a one mega ohm uh, input res uh, resistance, but it also claims it has a bandwidth of, let's say, one gigahertz. So is anybody bothered by this? Sounds perfectly reasonable to you to have a one mega ohm input resistance and a gigahertz of bandwidth? No. No, okay, why not? What's the problem? I mean, there's some capacitance associated with right. the probe. So how much capacitance could I actually have before I'm sort of totally hosed here? A millifarad? Uh, no, the millifarad's actually pretty big, right? <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. So what can, I, what can I tolerate there? You just have to, you know, you just, you just flipped it oh, by a few orders of magnitude. <laughs> a femtofarad? Yeah, it's about a femtofarad, right? That's a really small cap. I bet you, you know, that probe you've got that plugs into the thing definitely does not have a femtofarad, right? Well, so it turns out, if you really want a mega ohm of input resistance, at least at DC, but to really get a gigahertz bandwidth, you have to be clever. And in particular, you have to actually use a pole zero doublet. So the way they do this looks actually something like the following. So if you actually look inside of that scope head, the way it usually looks is something like this. Okay. So of course, there's some cap from the scope itself. They, have, they basically take that probe, and by the way, this is why there's some attenuation on there. So they basically split that one mega ohm resistance into two pieces like this. And now, of course, the clever thing they do is they say, well, okay, clearly it'd be really hard to actually get any kind of bandwidth out of this without doing something else. So why don't I actually intentionally introduce an extra zero into the system? Right? In other words, introduce just an extra feed-forward path to jump around. Well, so if I do something like this, then actually, indeed, it's not really the bandwidth per se, because indeed I have a pole zero doublet here. And you can work that out actually pretty quickly. But the trick the scope guys get to play is they say, well, OK, if I'm building the scope, I can calibrate this thing, right? So I can try and li line that cap up just right, so that actually the response I get in the time domain just looks perfect, okay? So just to give you an idea of how you might do something like that, let's just see, you know, if we put a step onto the input, what would that thing look like as I tune that cap? 
In other words, as I'm either slightly too small or slightly too big, what would the step response end up looking like? So let's start out with maybe something that's too small. What would the output you'd get on the scope look like? What do you guys think? I'll give you guys a reminder. Remember I said, you know, anytime you have something that has like a pole and a zero, it's really just the best thing is just to look at what, where it starts and where it ends. So, so in this case, where does it start? Step response. Yeah, for the step response, you know, so, but where does it start? So let's say that I have some C2 here. So let's say there's some C2 that's k times the optimal cap I actually want. Okay, so if I had the optimal capacitance, my step response would look perfect like this, right? Okay, so let's say that that k is now less than 1. In other words, my cap is a little bit too small. What would the step response look like? Would it ring up? Sorry, say that again? Would it ring up? Ring up. So I'm not going to get any ringing. I don't have any inductance or anything like that. Um, but I can actually have slightly different behavior. So if k is less than 1, then what's the initial value going to be? Is it going to be greater or less than the final value I actually want? If k is less than 1? It's going to be less than, right? Voltage divider. Exactly, right? Because if k is less than 1, that basically means that the cap voltage divider is smaller than the resistive voltage divider, right? So if I do k is less than 1, I'll get an initial step like this, but then it'll stop, right? And yes, caps are flipped over from resistors, so that's why, you know, when it's less than 1, it's flipped over, okay? So I get an initial step like this, and then it slowly settles up, right? Okay, so now hopefully this should be sort of obvious. What happens if k is greater than 1. Now what's the response going to look like? <coughs> the initial step's higher. Yeah, the initial step actually overshoots and then takes some time to settle back to where it was really supposed to be, right? So, you know, if I'm the scope <coughs> designer and I want to make sure this thing actually works, then what do I do? Well, I go, I put some steps in, I measure what this shape looks like, and I just tune this cap until I get the nice, clean step that I want in the first place, right? So if you have some source impedance at a gigahertz, you're going to have some attenuation, right? Yeah, no, so I mean, obviously, I've already done a 10 to 1 attenuation here, right? Now, you're also right that if I have some source resistance there, I've certainly got some cap that I'm sticking onto it there. Absolutely the case, right? Now... By the way, the good news is if I'm trying to build a 1 mega ohm thing, right, this is usually like 50 ohms or something like that. So usually that's not too bad, but you're absolutely right. You know, it's not that this is completely for free. Does this make sense? Or? Okay, so again, the point here is really that, you know, in general, for most of the stuff you're going to want to do, you're going to want to try and push those pull zero doublets outside of any of the band that you care about. But sometimes if you're really clever and you actually sort of really know what you're doing, you can actually exploit some of those things to do things that otherwise you didn't think would be possible. Okay. So is the minus 3 dB bandwidth of the scope head usually a little bit more than the scope, or what's the? Um, yeah. So it depends on exactly source, which so. thing you're looking at. You know, which type of probe it is, and etc. But you know, this is actually, if you look at the real-time scopes, this is literally this isn't even like the probe plug-in. This is just literally what sits at the very front end, right? Because again, it's kind of the only way you can get a reasonably high impedance without and that bandwidth without actually doing something else really funky, right? But is it is it like specified, for example, for a 50 ohm source to have some bandwidth? Oh, um, yeah, so uh, this is a general comment. So most test in instrumentation assumes that your source impedance is something like 50 ohms, at least coming off the transmission line. Uh, to the extent that, you know, for example, when you specify the swing on something, if you don't actually have 50 ohms on the other side, you'll get a different swing than what is written on the dial there. Uh, so yeah, that's actually a good general comment. If you're in the lab, pay attention because that's a really great way to blow up, particularly CMOS chips. Because if you don't have a you know 50 ohm load, you may actually get double the swing and blow stuff up. 
Now, obviously, if you have some other impedance, life can be different, right? So they may actually even tell you, if you go and look in the manual, okay, there's an X picofarads of load cap there that you're effectively driving. Any other questions on this? Or? Okay, so the last quote-unquote fun thing we have to deal with in terms of settling is slewing. So again, as I'm sure you guys have learned you know, many times before, Unfortunately, if you take any real amplifier and you put a large enough signal into the thing, what you're going to get is actually a nonlinear response. In particular, for things like our diff amps, right? if you think about kind of the way those things work, if you put a large enough input signal in either one way or the other, then essentially, eventually, you're just going to be steering all of the tail current to one side. right? Well, once you've done that, no more no more extra current you get out, right? In other words, no more kind of linear GM. So once that happens, then of course, things aren't going to basically settle as quickly as you thought they were. Because you've basically hit the limit in terms of how much current you can really supply to move the output around. So the typical way that we're going to sort of model something like that is to do something like the following. So if we say that this is V in, and this is the I out of our transconductance stage, or our OTA, it's typically going to look something like, roughly speaking, like this. OK, so if I take that you know, curve, uh, I'm sure you, know, you guys are great grad students and all that. I'm sure you could take that and plug it in and you know, do all the nonlinear differential equations and have tons of fun doing it. But probably not going to build a lot of design intuition, right? So from our standpoint, what we're basically going to model this is actually something that looks very similar, but just ever so slightly simpler to make our life easy. So of course, what I'm going to do is instead just say, well, OK, it's completely straight and then flat, and completely straight and then flat, right? Because you know, after all, I'm an engineer. So now the only interesting question is, Basically, what are those limit points? So to be specific, let's draw the actual circuit I'm talking about. So let's say I have a diff pair like this. I have ISS. And I have you know, some input devices like this. So first, just to make, you know, just maybe to answer the easy part. So what is this level right there? What's like the maximum current you're going to get out? Yeah, ISS. So this is, of course, just minus ISS. That's plus ISS. OK, so now if I want to model where this thing kind of completely clips, what's a good spot for me to choose for this? Where do you guys think that's going to be set by? When you move out of saturation. Yeah. OK, saturation, what, what were you? The swing. Um, so right now I've drawn a perfect load at the output. So I'm not, you know, even the load is not actually ever going to clip me. So everything here has to do with the input devices. So for a differential pair, how big of an input do you need to put in before you're sort of steering all of the current to one side or the other? Anybody seen this before? Well, even if not, there's a, there's a pretty simple guess you can take that's actually pretty accurate. OK, well, VDD will definitely do it. I agree with that. <laughs> but you know, maybe something even simpler. <laughs> or maybe even before that, I should say. They want to say it should go below the, near the threshold? Uh, OK, well, so let's say I have a certain common mode coming into here. All right, but I have some delta V that I'm putting. OK, so let's, even, let's assume that I'm not actually completely cutting the devices off. OK, so you know, that's kind of like the VDD answer. I agree that's correct, but how big of a differential input do I need to put in? VDD over 2. Uh, well, I guess I think that's also the VDD answer of you know, there's VDD on one side and ground on the other. You, you know, so you guys are all correct, but I claim that actually things will clip out a little bit before that. The common mode? No, I mean the overdrive. Like ah, OK. What do you mean by overdrive? What's, what's our magic term we like to call that by? V -star. There we go, V star. Right? Because remember, GM is just 2ID over V star. Right? 
Okay, so clearly if I put in V star of differential, where, by the way, this ID would really be in that differential pair, would really be it's 2 times ISS over 2, which just means that GM is equal to ISS over V star. And if you very quickly rearrange that, that tells you that ISS is equal to GM times V star. Well, guess what? If I put in a V star of differential, that means that I should have had a ISS of differential current flowing out of it, right? If I put any more than V star, something's clearly wrong. Meaning there's no way this will keep going like that. It's going to have to flatten out, right? So that point right there had better be V star, right? Because again, anything beyond that, and you're basically drawing more current out of that transconducting stage than is actually physically there, okay? Now, by the way, if you haven't seen this before, uh, if you actually did it for a long channel device, it's not exactly V star. It turns out to be square root of 2 V star. You can calculate it precisely. But for the short channel stuff and for sort of all the approximations we're going to make, assume it's essentially V star. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? Okay, so obviously we're going to take this now next time and figure out sort of how that impacts our overall settling response. So I'll see you guys next time when we finish that up.